The agricultural revolution in Britain led to the industrial revolution in Britain. The Dutch were the first to come into contact with the Chinese agricultural tools such as the iron plow, the seed drill, and the winnowing fan. Because of the wool trade with textiles in Flanders, knowledge of these tools very quickly spread from Flanders to Britain, and by 1730 it can be said that the agricultural revolution was underway in Britain. This new technology, along with crop rotation using, leg using legumes to replenish the soil for grains, resulted in Britain having an unprecedented population burst. Britain's population was 5.7 million by 1750, a number it had only reached before in 1300 and 1650. In those years, the population quickly fell uh, after it reached 5.7 million because food prices were too high, and so people decided not to have large families, which then resulted in lower population the next generation, which drove food prices down causing the next generation to have larger families, driving food prices up, causing them to have smaller families, etc., 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 and in this way, Britain's population was cyclical. In 1750, however, food prices did not go up, and so the population continued to grow. And in his hilarious ignorance of this uh, situation, Malthus predicted mass starvation as a result of continued population growth. As a result of this population growth, Britain had massive unemployment, and the formation of cottage industries. However, by the 1780s, industry began to develop as we know it, big old factories. In 1783, uh, the patent for the spinning mule expired, and so capitalists could legally build spinning mules, uh, which helped in textiles. In 1784, the Watt steam engine was invented, which was five times as efficient as steam engines prior. And in 1785, the patent on potting and stamping iron expired. These three things allowed capitalists to take advantage of the massive labor surplus that existed in Britain as a result of the agricultural revolution. An adult worker at a typical factory would work typically 14 hours a day in the summer and 4 hours a day in the winter. This is because Britain is near the Arctic Circle and so extreme fluctuations in sunlight was a serious issue. So you had really long hours in the summer, really short hours in the winter. Unfortunately, there was a window tax in Britain. And so, and so factory owners cut costs by having less windows. Most factory owners would have liked to have more windows as this would have resulted in more sunlight, this would have resulted in the factories being more airy, and would have resulted in um, greater productivity, but they couldn't because the state put a tax on uh, windows and so the factories were unnecessarily dreary. Child labor was common during this time, especially in textiles where small hands were well suited to, to uh, disentangling cot spools. Children were paid about three pennies a week, uh, and adults earned six pennies a week. Here's what a penny could get you in those days. A penny could get you one week's room and board at an inn. No bed, so you'd have to sleep on the floor, and you'd get one meal a day. Typically some bread, some oatmeal, and perhaps some fish once or twice a week. Uh, three pennies a week would have been enough for a mattress and three meals a day. Uh, if this seems harsh, remember that the life expectancy in Britain prior to the Industrial Revolution was about 21 years, and most people uh, lived regularly on the brink of starvation. Okay, So when you're looking at the early Industrial Revolution, you got to compare this to the Dark Ages. right? And so as horrible as child labor may seem, it was, it was uh, so much better than the alternatives where... Um, which was uh, life as a thief, uh, life in an orphanage, or life as a prostitute. A child was more likely to die in an orphanage than a factory, uh, so as much as child labor offends our, sen our sensibilities, you've got to remember the times. The prime opponents to industrialization were, of course, the state, the landed aristocracy, and its attack dog, the church. Uh, this is because industrialization took people off of their net, off of their you know, agricultural net. And as usual, the church and state acted as retrograde institutions. Uh, it was during this time in Britain that William Godwin wrote his novels and tracts on anarchism. Godwin uh, lived from 1756 to 1836. At first, Godwin noted that the bulk of human conflict centered around property, or more specifically, land and capital. Uh, wars were fought over it. People starved because they couldn't uh, hunt animals that were on someone else's property. And so Godwin came to the conclusion that you could eliminate much of the suffering in the world by eliminating private property. Then, uh, and so at first he was just against private property. Then Godwin realized that 80% of the wealth in Britain was owned by 2% of the population. And at this time, wealth was uh, used as a synonym for property. You know, wealth was property and the buildings on it. That's, that's what was called wealth at that time. 
Uh, and it wasn't much of a leap to recognize that this was because certain people had access to the coercive apparatus of the state and used that force to appropriate properties uh, for themselves. And, and the other 20% was apparently sanctioned by the state. And so Godwin had his breakthrough and identified the state as the cause of private property. And so to abolish private property, one must abolish the state. Uh, Proudhon later refined these ideals, but Godwin uh, put forth the central thesis uh, that is used you know, by anti-private property anarchists to this day. Uh, the first anarchists are of a pre-industrial mindset. Um, they could not conceive of capital owners who justly acquired their capital and used their capital in a mutually beneficial way uh, because it had never been done before. It had never been done before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they assumed that without a state, nobody would strive to individually own the means of production uh, because if man did, say, acquire a factory, nobody would work in it when they could work in a commonly owned factory, and so he would, quote, own, close quote, an empty factory. Nobody wanted to be a wage slave, would want to be a wage slave, according to Godwin and his uh, followers, and his later uh, followers. This idea of capital without the capitalist is not entirely without merit, as the success of cover recovered factories in Argentina have demonstrated. And if employee-owned firms are in fact more productive than traditional hierarchical firms, then those firms will come to dominate in a stateless society. But here's why this is actually rather anticlimactic. If the state collapses, then the hierarchical firms no longer enjoy state benefits. In which, the ca in which case, if the owners of the firms want to be competitive with uh, communal firms or, or employee-owned firms, the management will have to cut its pay to as much as the managers of the communal firms anyway. To put it another way, without the state, the distinction between hierarchical and communal firms will be only nominal. As without state barriers to entry, management will uh, not be able to earn more than its marginal revenue product. I am of the opinion that in a stateless society you will have nominally hierarchical firms, but because they would exist in a truly competitive market, managers will no longer be able to pay themselves more than their marginal revenue product. And so you will have the benefits of a theoretical employee-owned firm, you simply won't have its form. So that's my view on the Industrial Revolution and early anarchism, why I don't think you will see communal firms in a free market, but also why it doesn't really matter.